Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, in conversation with a critically acclaimed Nigerian author and pop culture icon. My name is Chimamanda Adichie. I'm a writer, and I'm in the stream. Femi OK is away on assignment this week, but before she left, she was on Facebook Live with Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She's author of works like Purple Hibiscus, Half of a Yellow Sun, and perhaps her most widely read 2013 work, Americana. She spent time chatting with Femi, opening up about her thoughts on upcoming authors, U.S. politics, and even her new baby daughter. Chimamanda started off by taking a question from our community. Ms. Adichie, you're my fave writer and novelist. I think so much when I read your work. Do you consider yourself an educator at all? Uh, do I consider, yeah, I suppose so in a way. I, I, don't, I don't like to think of starting out my fiction with the intent to teach because I think it can get in the way of, of storytelling. But I'm always happy to hear that my work has somehow educated in some way. Chinua Achebe was a great African writer, a great Nigerian writer, just a great writer full stop. When you spent time with him, what was he like? I remember going to this event where he was, where his work was being honored and he just, and he, he seemed to just have still this sense of, um, you know, he, I don't know, he didn't seem jaded at right. all. Yeah. And there was something about it that was so lovely and refreshing. He said something about you when you first started writing that was so interesting. I wanted our audience to see this as well. And he says, we do not usually associate wisdom with beginners, but here's a new writer endowed with the gift of ancient storytellers. Adiche knows what is at stake, what to do about it. She is fearless or she would not have taken on the intimidating horror of Nigeria's civil war. How was that to read that? How did you even find out that he wrote that about you? Um, I remember, actually, when I found out, I just sat down and cried. My editor had sent him the manuscript, and she hadn't told me. And so when he, um, when he got back to her with that, she called me, and she read it out to me, and I just cried. And it meant so much to me, and I think it's still the most meaningful thing that anybody has said about my work. And, you know, here's a man who I have loved, adored, um, looked up to for so long. And to think that he had time to read what I wrote and to say that meant so much to me. But, but I have a story to tell you, though, mm -hmm. for me about my, about, um, so, so that happened. And of course, I told everybody in my family, you know, this is what Chinua Chibi said about my work. Right. And now my sister-in-law, Tinuke, who is also one of my closest friends, when she started reading Happy Villa, she called me and she said, I've just started the book. Are you sure this is the book Chino Achebe said he likes? <laughs> oh, and, okay. and I said, yes. <laughs> and I said, yes. And she said, why? <laughs> so that's that's sort of the that's the other side of the Chino Achebe quote. <laughs> so Half of the Yellow Sun, it's the 10th anniversary of its, of its publication. And Shreen asked you, Half of the Yellow Sun was beautiful. It was thoughtful. It was thorough. How long did it actually take to research? It was a book about the Biafra War. It took very, I think I spent, I'm going to say I spent about six and a half years um, working on that book. I did a lot of research before I started the actual writing. So I, I read lots of books. I went and looked at the archives. I listened to the music of that period. I, I listened to um, radio broadcasts um, in the archives. I just really wanted to immerse myself in that period to know, to try and imagine what life was like. And then I depended a lot on stories that people told me, especially my father's stories. Mm -hmm. so, you write so many characters. Do you have one that is so close to you, so dear to you, that will always it almost feels like a friend rather than a character? Huh, do you know, I, I don't know if I can, I mean, I, I guess maybe Ubu in Half of a Yellow Sun. Ubu is very unlike me in the the kind of, not, you know, his male, his, but he, I think, is the character who is most me, in a way, uh -huh. I think. Right. But then it's hard to tell. It's hard. I don't like to be my own my own therapist. It's hard to really <laughs> know about yourself. I know you bought something to read. What did you bring? What did you decide that you were going to read to us? Um, so I thought I would read a, a small bit from a short story I recently wrote and was published in The New Yorker called uh, Apollo. Okay. They had, too, a new baffling patience for incredible stories. 
Once, my mother told me that a sick neighbor in Abba, our ancestral hometown, had vomited a grasshopper, a living, writhing insect, which, she said, was proof that wicked relatives had poisoned him. Somebody texted us a picture of the grasshopper, my father said. They always supported each other's stories. When my father told me that Chief Okeke's young house help had mysteriously died, and the story around town was that the chief had killed the teenager and used her liver for money-making rituals, my mother added, they say he used the heart too. Fifteen years earlier, my parents would have scoffed at these stories. My mother, a professor of political science, would have said nonsense in her crisp manner. And my father, a professor of education, would merely have snorted the stories not worth the effort of speech. It puzzled me that they had shed those old selves and become the kind of Nigerians who told anecdotes about diabetes cured by drinking holy water. Still, I humored them and half listened to their stories. It was a kind of innocence, this new childhood of old age. That's beautiful. Hassan asks on Facebook, he says, how do you see the Nigerian literary scene right now? I'm very excited about it. I think, I think there's a lot of talent in Nigeria. And I think there's always been a lot of talent. I think what's different now is that there are more and more opportunities for readers to see their talent. Um, I do a workshop, a writing workshop every year in Lagos, and I'm just always astonished by the number of people who apply and by how many people are really talented. So I'm um, just really, the number of young people I'm, I'm waiting to read from, so it's, I think this is a good time for Nigerian literature, actually for African literature do and you, African literature. Do you think you can spot somebody who's going to be a great writer? Or do you see somebody's talent like, oh my goodness, this is incredible? Yes, I, but, but I think I need to qualify that. I, can, yeah. I think I can spot talent, uh -huh. but I think, that to, I think it takes more than talent. I think that there are people who can write a good sentence, but it doesn't mean they can write a good story. Ah. I also think that it requires hard work and dedication, that people who have started out well and have sort of fallen off because, you know, writing really, it, it, it requires a certain kind of, you know, just being focused. And so I can't necessarily say that I can tell who's going to be successful, but I can tell who has talent. Aisha Mohammed on Twitter sent us this tweet for you, and she asks, any advice for budding teenage writers living in Nigeria who want to get published internationally? Well, first thing I would say is maybe don't think about getting published internationally. Just think about writing the best that you can do. And, and I think the most important advice for somebody who's starting out is read. Read everything. Read, read, read. Read very widely. Read so that you know what you don't like. Read so that you know what you like. Read. And of course, write. Writing is like practice in many ways. Writing is... You need to do it over and over again. So I would say read and then write. I think a lot of people who want to write spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, they want to be published. They, yeah. And really, sometimes you just need to write. What's the last thing that you wrote that you thought, oh, that was a good line? <laughs> 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 I haven't lost my touch. <laughs> you know what, Femi? I wish, I wish I had that more often. I, yes. I I'm not having that as often as I would like. Okay, so then you must be able to remember the last time then, Jim Miranda, if it's not happening as often <laughs> as you would like it to. Um, you know, maybe, actually, I know, I think, oh, right, I think it was, um, I, I recently wrote a story for the New York Times about uh, Donald Trump. Aha, uh -huh. um, yes. And I had a lot of fun because I would just stop and laugh. And, and it's not necessarily that I thought any particular line was that good. But at the end of it, I sort of thought, you know what? I kind of did what I wanted to do. And that made me happy. We've got a little picture of that story in the New York Times. It's a work of fiction. What were you thinking as you sat down to write it? Because it's, it's well, well, you tell us. You tell us the thought process. <laughs> it is funny and it's satire. But I think it's only funny if you're not going to vote for Trump or you're not a Trump supporter. <laughs> I would say. Very good point. Yes. That's, I think Go that's ahead. a fair point. Yeah. That is fair. Um, I think, <laughs> well, I wanted to, I was asked, I, I wanted to write about, I felt mm. that I was, it, it, I, I just think that the American political scene right now is, is so absurd that um, it's almost difficult to make fun of, if that makes sense. It's, it's almost as though it's a parody of a parody. 
And so I didn't necessarily want to focus on that. I thought I would write about things that happened behind the scenes. And I also wanted to write about women. I wanted to write about the women in Donald Trump's life. I wanted to imagine what their lives were like. Mm. And I also think that his daughter, Ivanka, is very interesting. I mean, I, I don't think it's possible to know a person from their public appearances because I think people are complex. But it seems to me that just from watching her, that she seems too intelligent to really believe that her father is the right choice for the US. And so I imagined her as a daughter who loves her father, who humors him, but who secretly supports the candidate she really thinks is the right one, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the story in which there's kind of a, but I did also didn't want to, I think that to have that, I think we needed a sense of mystery. So I thought I'm not going to write it from her point of view because then we kind of lose the mystery. So I thought I would write it from his wife's point of view. And so I had a lot of fun. I imagined his wife as this character who, not necessarily, I mean, you're right about it. This is not a story for people who are Trump fans, obviously, and I am not a Trump fan, that's very clear. But I also wanted to humanize her. I think that it's easy for people to become caricatures, and I hoped that the story would humanize her while not necessarily being overly sympathetic yeah, to her. Yeah. See, last year you did a commencement speech at Wellesley College, that's a private college for women, um, and the young ladies as you were doing the commencement speech was very excited, they were waving their programs in the air, and this, this is how you started that speech. Have a listen. I have admired Wellesley, its mission, its story, its successes for a long time, and I thank you very much for inviting me. You are ridiculously lucky to be graduating from this bastion of excellence and on these beautiful acres. And if the goddesses and gods of the universe do the right thing, then you will also very soon be the proud alumni of the college that produced America's first female president. Go, Hillary! Why are you with her? Explain. <laughs> I am with her because any reasonable person who's watching what's going on in the U.S. has to be with her. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in a sense, it's kind of sad as well because I wish it wasn't. It seems to me fairly obvious that anybody who means well for the U.S. has to support Hillary Clinton because Donald Trump just isn't a viable option. But on the other hand, I wish she did, in fact, have an opponent with whom we could, you know, engage and exchange real ideas. But I support Hillary Clinton because I've admired her for a long time. Um, because I think she's very hardworking, because I think she's very intelligent, because I think she understands how the world works, because I largely agree with her ideology. I, I like the way she looks at the world. I don't agree with everything, um, but, but largely she's a woman about whom I would be comfortable if she were in charge of, of the U.S. Can we get back to our Facebook Live questions? Here's Syrah. She says, I was wondering, do you ever face an authoritative crisis back home, back home being Nigeria, with people assuming that because you write in English for a global audience, your work isn't authentically native and you don't tell their stories? No. No, because language, I mean, Nigeria is English speaking. And um, I, I speak Igbo as well. I'm, I'm bilingual. but. But the interesting thing is that most Igbo people can't even read Igbo. So most Igbo people read in English. And so I don't think that my choice of language, which, again, is a Nigerian language, means that I'm writing for a global audience. I think I'm writing for, I'm writing for Nigerians. And I'm writing also, really, I'm writing for anyone who, writes, who likes to read the kind of books that I like to read. I don't think of my work as geared towards a global audience. Uh -huh. But I also want to say that I think of Nigeria as part of the globe. So <laughs> a global audience necessarily um, includes Nigeria. I want to show you some Instagram pictures of, of you. If you ever Googled yourself, I'm, I'm sure you'll find all sorts of things. No, no, do you, no, no, do you no, do no. it? I do not, no. Have you no, ever Googled a... yourself? Ever? Oh, I, I used to. I stopped in the, in, um, the year that uh, the thing around your neck came out. Okay. I stopped. It's right. just so unhealthy. I, right. I, it's just very unhealthy. All right. All right. So we did it for you, so you didn't have to worry. So, oh, uh, good Lord. Ha have a look I mean, at this. Sure <laughs> we only pick the good stuff, don't worry. Uh, the Instagram, look at this. I'm just going to flick through some of the things we found. People are quoting you, people are using you as inspiration. There are animated pictures of you, there are gifts of you. 
there are cartoons of you. It, go, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, you're obviously a pop culture personality. At what point did you realize that that was happening to you, that people were beginning to take what you were saying and saying, oh, this is, this is uh, inspirational. I'm going to use this. I'm going to quote Chimamanda Adichie. Um, I don't know. I think, I think it was probably at one of my events. Um, yeah. So probably, so it was maybe around half of the yellow sun um, that I would go to events and I would talk to people and I would realize that they actually really followed what I was doing. Mm -hmm. and. But but actually, I think what's most meaningful to me is when they say, here's how what you said or did um, made a difference in my own life. Give us an example. Um, so there's a, right, so a young woman who, in tears, said to me once, you make me stronger. What was the context for that? Did she explain? She, she said, you make me strong, and she was in tears. And I, because I'm, I'm given to sometimes some moments of sort of foolish emotional outburst, I also had tears in my eyes, yeah. um, which I suppose didn't give her an opportunity to tell me what she meant. But before that, she had talked about um, an interview that I gave to a, a Danish newspaper, I think, um, something that I had said about women's strength being normal, right? That I, for me, it wasn't a remarkable thing that women were strong, and she said that that had made her feel stronger. Vivian wanted to know, what is the most important thing that we should be teaching, that mothers should be teaching their daughters? <sighs> the most important, I would say, huh, I, I need a lot of time to think about this. I don't think there is one most important thing. Mm -hmm. I do think that in general, it, it's important not to think of them as girls. And I say that it's important to think of them as individuals. So. I think we start very early to start shaping them into what they're supposed to be. I was talking to a woman who has a, a son, and she said that when she would go to play dates with um, mothers of daughters, that her son was sort of very, and he was 18 months, and he was sort of very curious, and she let him do whatever he wanted to mm -hmm. do, exploring. And then when the little girls wanted to, their mothers would say, no, 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 that's not nice. Be polite, behave yourself. And so that early, you, you, this, she got the sense that the, the baby girls were already starting to be restrained starting to be shaped into this is how to be a girl, you, you're polite, you sit down quietly. So I would really just say, let them be individuals. Let them, you know, watch them and see what interests them and, and encourage it, whatever it is. And, yeah. and it's important for us to say to children, you can be what you want to be, rather than saying to them, well, you're a girl, therefore you have to be a certain way. Uh -huh. Do you, when you look at your little one uh, and think back to when you were a kid, are you thinking about, oh, my parents did this, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to do that? Are you, are you shaping your, your family through how you lived your life as a kid? I think I'm shaping it more about the way I see the world. I think my mother, I mean, my parents, considering the time and place, you know, growing up in the very early 80s in Nigeria, my parents were actually remarkably progressive. Um, and so it's not so much my wanting to do things differently from how my parents did it. It's my, first of all, being terrified because, you know, you can do everything you want and your mm. child will turn out <laughs> because you just never know. Mm. But it's also just, I want to, um, I just hope I get it right. I want her to not, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. That's a hard one to, to answer. I want her to be... Normal. And a yeah. friend of mine was saying to me, oh, she's probably going to start writing when she's five. And I thought, I hope she actually doesn't write. I hope she's not interested in writing. Really? Yeah. Uh, this comes from Pascal Egent on Twitter. He says, I've read Half of a Yellow Sun, Americana, Purple Hibiscus, which impacted and deepened my understanding. Are we to expect another book? Well, first of all, thank you to Pascal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hope so. I don't know. I, 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 I'm superstitious. I never like talking about things in progress because right. I just worry that that's the way to jinx them. Sure. Is, I remember is, that my, why, my grandma, is that why half the world didn't realize that you were expecting a baby? I think there's, it's, it's, it's not so much about jinxing it, really. I'm not hmm. superstitious about pregnancy. I mean, I think, I, think, I think many Africans are, you know, so women will sort of hide things because they're worried about witches and whatnot. But that's not, <laughs> that's not my thing. It's just that, that I wanted it to be very private. I wanted it to be something I shared with just the people I love. And also sure. because I, I think it was also a very conscious decision not to want to do the sort of public performance of pregnancy 
I don't like the way that people will say things like, oh, here's the baby bump as though pregnancy is sort of the latest accessory. Um, I think pregnancy is a very serious, very sacred thing. And um, and I also think that when we talk about it in that kind of flippant way, it, it I think it, it um, almost trivializes it. And, and I think it also makes it much more difficult to talk about the, the real challenges of not only carrying a child, having a child, and then what happens to to your life afterwards. You know, I just, it's something I take quite seriously. And so I just didn't want to do the public performance of it. Uh -huh. So what are you reading right now? What's on your bedside table? Is it like, you know, a, <laughs> like a how, how to night train babies? Is it something like that? No, no, actually, no. I, I did that. I did that early in my pregnancy. And then I right. thought, you know what? You know, I thought I'm so tired of this. So I stopped because I felt that it was making me, it was increasing my anxiety level. Right. And then, you know, you sort of read about things like when my baby was four months old, she went to nursery school, that sort of thing. And I was right. just like, you know. <laughs> but um, no, I'm reading a Norwegian novel that my friend Aslak sent to me, and it's called See You Tomorrow. Uh -huh. I'm also reading my friend Binya Vanga Wainaina's um, writing he's sort of working on a novel so i'm actually reading right now yeah. the man the chapter he sent me i'm reading um i'm reading hishamata's memoir about going back to libya to look to his father went missing his father Gaddafi arrested his father many years ago and and i'm reading this memoir he wrote that is so beautiful about going back to libya um after the fall of Gaddafi. so i sort of i, I read a number of things at the same time Marlette says, love you to Mamanda Ngozi, a DJ. I feel fortunate to be part of your generation and live in a time where you exist and write. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's very lovely. Thank you. So Chimamanda, we, we asked our online community favorite lines that they love from you. Be thinking of your favorite line and, and we'll share some of you, some of these from you. Dear non-American black, when you make the choice to come to America, you become black. Stop arguing. Stop saying I'm Jamaican or I'm Ghanaian. America doesn't care. Here's the other one that got a lot of votes. Racism should never have happened, and so you don't get a cookie for reducing it. And check out this video comment as well. My favorite Chimamanda quote is from Half of a Yellow Sun. It goes like this. This is our world, although the people who drew this map decided to put their own land on top of ours. There is no top or bottom, you see. And it means a lot to me because I'm a big believer that when you're out in space, the Earth can take any orientation, and the map is just a figment of our imagination. Do you... Amen, my brother. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> Do you remember your lines? I mean, that, that was over 10 years ago from Half of a Yellow Sun. Does, does it stay with you, or do you just get rid of it and then on to the I, next I thing? No, I, it's, I think it's both. I don't always remember. Yeah. I mean, I remember some, so I remember yeah. that bit, for example. Yeah. But there are times when I, I don't remember everything. And so sometimes, you know, friends have said to me, well, you said that in your book. I'm like, no, I never said that. Yeah. And then it turns out I actually did. But there's some lines that, I mean, that it's sort of, um, I think William Faulkner called it your darlings and when you're a writer. The, the lines that you think, oh, this is very good. And sometimes you leave them in, even though they should really not be in the story. Um, so I have some darlings that I remember. And yeah, and, and I think maybe sometimes it's also the lines that somehow reflect my politics. And the line that he, he read is one of them because it's not just what the character believes, it's also what I believe. That's all the time we have for today. But remember, the conversation continues online with hashtag AJStream and on Facebook, facebook.com slash AJStream. See you next time.